hate to take you on another of these history lessons, but I have really no alternative. <coughs> Jasper Ridley, Jasper Ridley, a very, very, very good writer, drew a comparison between the 16th and the 20th centuries. The 16th century, you know, was the century of the Reformation ideological war on the Christian level in which they used everything false papers and forged passports and phony names and secret agents and conspiracies and revolutionary efforts and everything all at once extremely difficult period to live through very important in terms of uh, Christian history Elizabeth I of England believed in herself much more sincerely than she did in any religion. She didn't think religion was a serious issue, and she regarded religious dissent from the doctrines of the Church of England as an effort at rebellion, a pretext to deny her authority as Queen of England to rule over the Church. Consequently, she authorized the creation of a high commission, which was under the authority of the Archbishop of Canterbury, to investigate and to punish any minister who disagreed with the doctrines of the Church of England. The high commission could also go beyond that. It could investigate seditious writings or false rumors or <coughs> what they called slanderous words. Now, this is a very wide net. To assist its inquiries, the Commission could summon anyone, and those who refused to appear could be fined or put in prison. And those who did appear had to take an oath to answer all questions truthfully. And refusal to take that oath was tantamount to conviction of sedition against the Church. The answers that did not please the Commission provided both the basis for official charges and the proof of such charges. Furthermore, the accused was not allowed a lawyer because the Commission said it wasn't a court. And those who protested that the Commission could punish were told that, well, yes, it could punish, but it couldn't execute. Therefore, it had no capital powers. All it could do was throw a minister out of his livelihood, or fine him, or imprison him, or, in other words, ruin him. Something like a congressional inquiry. Now, the Protestant reformers hated the High Commission. Burley, later Lord Cecil, said, even the inquisitors of Spain use not so many questions to comprehend and trap their prey. And one of them even wrote a book against forcing men to testify against themselves and said the Magna Carta forbids such a practice. It didn't in reality, but it was great propaganda. Then the Queen learned that there was a group called separatists who considered the Church of England as corrupt as the Vatican and who wanted to start a new church. Well, that enraged the Queen, who said they were simply sub sub subversives. The Commission had a number of separatists arrested and thrown into a prison that was called the Clink. And their leader, Henry Barrow, was hunted throughout the realm. Barrow was finally caught when he visited one of his congregation in the clink. And of course he was brought before the Archbishop, Whitgrift, and the High Commission. He asked why he was arrested, and he was told that he would be told as soon as he took the oath to answer all questions truthfully. And Barrow then said he would swear, but only if he was not forced to swear. The Archbishop then broke his own rule 
and told Barrow that he was arrested for not attending the Church of England and thereby defying the Queen. Barrow said those were charges. If evidence were produced, he would swear. And the Archbishop began to sweat a little bit. He said Barrow's word would be more readily accepted than any evidence and asked him again to take the oath. And Barrow said, I would know to what I swear before I swear. The Archbishop kept his temper long enough to run around that circle one more time. If anything unlawful was asked, he said, Barrow need not answer. I have not learned to so swear, said Barrow. I will first know and consider the matter before I take an oath. At that, Archbishop's patient snaps and they sent him back to the clink. On the next occasion, the Archbishop tried again, but he found Barrow's position to be so difficult that he took the unprecedented step of producing the charges. These were based on a manuscript that had denounced the Church of England. Barrow disagreed and refused to take the oath. Where is his keeper? The archbishop shouted. Away with him. Clap him up close. Let no man come at him. Now these proceedings created a sensation and a special commission was created simply to deal with Barrow. But Barrow would not provide the government with the testimony it needed to convict him. On his third appearance before the High Commission, he was asked if he had ever spoken against the Church of England, and he said, when you produce your witness, I will answer. The Archbishop leaned forward and said, but upon your oath, we will believe you. And Barrow replied, I will not accuse myself. Now, that resistance should not be taken lightly. <coughs> Barrow, in the end, was hanged. But his manner before the High Commission inspired everyone else who appeared. Somebody had to stand up. Somebody had to answer. And somebody had to answer in such an intelligent way that everyone else could perceive the injustice of the proceedings so that even the members of the High Commission were embarrassed by their own behavior. While Elizabeth was still on the throne and the High Commission was still functioning, a case was brought against Thomas Cartwright, one of the great leaders of the Reformation and nine of his associate ministers. Like Barrow before him, Cartwright refused to take the oath until he knew the nature of the charges. The High Commission did to him what it regarded as the favor of reading the charges. And Cartwright then asked for a lawyer and said he would reply selectively. This angered the Archbishop to such an extent that he wanted to turn Cartwright over to the Star Chamber. And the Star Chamber, you will recall, examined cases of treason and used torture. Its punishments ranged through an entire series of horrors, from lopping off noses to clipping ears to public whippings, to service in the galleys as a slave, to the rack, and to death by being drawn and quartered. Now I cite all this not to recall ancient things, but to recall some of the realities of the 16th century and of that some of the realities of the reign of that great feminist state favorite Elizabeth I. Her high commission continued its persecution of reformers as well as Catholics all through the rest of her reign. Her star chamber continued its tortures. The last Lord Chancellor of England to sit and watch a man being tortured on the rack was Sir Francis Bacon, that great favorite of scientific historians. And I recall these matters because they provide us with a brief glimpse of a period of immense Christian courage against all odds. 
There is a long list of those who resisted the High Commission of Elizabeth I and James I and Charles I, for the institution lasted through the reigns of all three. The persecution of the English and Scots Calvinists under these three monarchs is what led to the real English Revolution under Oliver Cromwell. And Cromwell himself, you remember, was stopped on his way to take a ship to America to escape the persecution. At one time, all Americans knew this. They honored those who crossed the Atlantic in unsafe vessels, who first settled and civilized this land. Do you think they traveled all that distance across that unsafe sea to confront wild animals and untamed forests and savages to make money? They came for religious freedom without which no society worthy of the name can be created. And they were pursued here as well as in England. One of the causes of the American War of Independence was the resistance of Presbyterians to the Church of England, which wanted to export its rules and its bishops and its prohibitions to these shores. It wanted to establish the Church of England here with all its rulings and disabilities against Jews and Protestants holding public office. Jews and dissenters, we'd say, dissenters from the Church of England. The fact that most Americans did not know the history of this nation is very significant. You recall that this morning I mentioned Solzhenitsyn's comment that to destroy a people you must first sever their roots. Imagine if you can how the Jewish people could possibly have survived after the fall of Jerusalem and they were scattered among the nations of the world if they had not been allowed to retain the memory of their history through the centuries, their sacred books, their great men, their teachers, the record of their vicissitudes. If Jewish children had not been taught their backgrounds, their great leaders and thinkers, they would long ago have been swallowed in the sea of humanity, submerged, disappeared, vanished. Yet Christian children are not taught the origins of the Fifth Amendment to our Constitution, nor do they know that the Puritans and Presbyterians were following the Old Testament rules in creating the Fifth Amendment. For in Talmudic law, no man was allowed to plead guilty in a criminal case, nor was his own testimony against himself accepted. A crime in ancient Israel had to have two witnesses to be proven. Although in civil offenses, a man could admit culpability that was not acceptable in capital or criminal cases. Thus the connection between religion and law in our society can be traced from ancient times to the present and the basis for equity made clear to everyone. I venture to say that Harvard Law School does not teach this, that most of our judges do not know it, that our society is eroding for lack of this and other insights into the foundations of our civilization. Nor is this the only area that is being obscured by the proponents of revolution and the devotees of secularism. We are inundated by racial arguments, by what the English now call the race relations industry referring to those who make a livelihood out of accusing others of prejudice, who make themselves important as spokesmen for particular races, though they are neither elected nor appointed. Many of these self-selected modern Pharisees have denounced Christianity as bigoted and intolerant. John Lawson earlier today quoted some of those charges. Yet Christianity was the first universal religion 
which termed all men of all races and ethnic and genetic origin brothers under God the Father. To be a Christian is not a matter of being descended from particular parents of a particular group, or to come from a special part of the world, or to be of a certain color, or speak a special language, or possess property, or a special education, or a position in the world. Modern Christians seem to have forgotten how special this was. No black tribe in the history of the world has made other black men equal to its own members under its own law or to those born inside that society. No Indian tribe has accepted men from another tribe as equal in its teepees or in the council of its chiefs. The Chinese word for foreigners was and is devils. The Japanese claim to this day descent from the gods and sealed off their island for centuries. The Mohammedans who borrowed from both Judaism and Christianity came centuries later to accept all races. But the Christian example is what feeds the rhetoric of even secular revolutionaries. How many American students are taught that the founders of this republic were the first in 17 centuries in the history of the West to accept Jews as equal citizens with all others in this country, and not as a result of a campaign, not as a result of protests and demonstrations, but voluntarily? No other country ever did this, and no other religion. Islam does not open its gates. Israel does not open its gates. China does not open its gates. In the entire history of the world, no religion or region has been as open as this in elevating the rights of all human beings, in helping all others. The Christian West, of which we are a part, was unique in the history of all civilizations of all time in saving the lives of others through medical and technological and social and political and economic innovations. The West is still pouring billions into other cultures, other lands, other regions, other races, other civilizations. It seems to be overlooked in all history that no other religion ever poured money into the Christian religion or the Christian civilization in order to assist it or sat down and tried to plan how Christians could advance and prosper in this world. There was no foreign aid after the collapse of Rome to enable the West to rise. No visitors from other civilizations taught the Europeans new methods of agriculture and industry. No foreign banks sent money or experts, no private groups sent nurses or physicians, engineers or cartographers, educators or merchants to help the West. When I was a boy in American elementary school, I was not taught that when the pilgrims landed in Massachusetts, the Spanish Christians already had a functioning university in South America for decades a university where the students were Indian and the teachers were Spanish, and that was the least of the ignorance of my teachers. The inability to defend the civilization and the Christian faith is not simply due to a lack of historical information and perspective. It is due to a complete overlooking of the available information by which we defend ourselves. 
It's one thing to overlook the ignorance of modern Christians regarding centuries of Roman persecution unleashed against Christians by Nero in ancient Rome. But it's another thing to overlook the ignorance of Christians who listen in silence to slanders against the history of their own faith and religion. It's something else to forgive modern American Christians for overlooking the greatest wave of Christian persecution in all history which is underway now. The career of Solzhenitsyn. Career of Solzhenitsyn epitomizes both the grandeur of Christianity and the weird indifference of the American Christian community. <coughs> Let me digress into this. Solzhenitsyn was a poor boy raised by a widowed mother. He became an ardent communist. He was so ardent for communism that he carried a copy of Karl Marx's Das Kapital with him on his honeymoon. <coughs> And he was so faithful to the faith of Marxism that he was accepted into the university, which is a signal favor in the USSR, granted only after a searching investigation by a special committee. He graduated as an engineer, entered the army, became an officer in World War II, acquitted himself honorably in combat, and was promoted to captain. Stalin, you'll remember, elevated the morale of the Soviet armed forces during World War II by ending the comrade period and reintroducing shoulder boards and gold braids. At that point, Solzhenitsyn was proud of himself and of the Soviet system. If at that time he said the KGB had said, you're just the sort of young man we're looking for, come with us. I would have gone gladly, he said, and in all likelihood I would have wound up as a torturer in the cellars of the Lubyanka prison like the others. Instead, it was my good fortune to go to Siberia where I met God. Then the Soviets, through their spies at Los Alamos, learned of our nuclear experiments. And they sent teams all over the Soviet Union looking for people who had a knowledge of physics. Even into the prisons and even into the gulag. And Solzhenitsyn presented himself. He was transferred to a special installation where he received better food and quarters and where the prisoner scientists worked on nuclear problems. And while he was there, he contracted cancer. Now this illness appears to have been a test of his faith, <coughs> administered by God, but Solzhenitsyn could not have known that, and neither could his physicians. They examined him repeatedly, and the cancer spread. He was transferred to a cancer ward, where little could be done to check his disease. His wife divorced him. The physicians told him there was no hope and he was released to die. But his faith <coughs> was undiminished. And as we know, he did not die. Instead, the cancer vanished. And he wrote a book called A Day in the Life of Ivan Desinovich. The manuscript came to the attention of the dictator Khrushchev. There is something almost biblical about this whole thing because God softened the heart of Khrushchev who was known as the butcher of the Ukraine because when he read that manuscript he gave permission to have it published and that made Solzhenitsyn world famous overnight. He wrote more books. He wrote The Cancer Ward. He wrote several others. He became known as an irritant to the Soviet government. He received the Nobel Prize and was not allowed to travel to Sweden to accept the award personally. And a great campaign was created to keep him from being murdered by his government. Meanwhile, he was hidden at the country estate of the great cellist Rostropovich. 
From where he secretly sent word to all the prison camps and elsewhere that those who had had experience with the justice system of the Soviet Union should write down the details of their trial and conviction and punishment and send it to him through the Underground Railroad. He put these together, all these stories of all these hundreds and hundreds of people, men and women, in three stupendous books, the Gulag Archipelago, one, two, three. I recommended them to Tom Phillips of Raytheon, and he said, oh, well, he said, they're just harrowing to read. It's not necessary. Famous Christian convert. The KGB knew that he was compiling these histories, and they searched everywhere for that manuscript, but he successfully smuggled it out to the West. And then the Soviet authorities decided that to allow him to remain inside their nation would provide possible rebels with a possible leader. So first they put him into the Lubyanka prison in Moscow, and then after a high-level meeting, they had him deported. And a few days later, they sent his second wife and children after him in order to deprive him of the status of a martyr. Now, that was another miracle in Solzhenitsyn's remarkable life. The gates of that land lifted just long enough to let him out and then clapped shut again. The rest of the story is equally unusual and equally significant. Solzhenitsyn was appalled at the decadence he discovered in the West. He arrived here and said the United States looked to him like Russia in 1905. If you want to know your future, he said, look at our past. Invited to speak at a Harvard commencement in June 1978, nearly nine years ago, he said, a decline in courage may be the most striking feature that an outside observer notices in the West today. The Western world has lost its civil courage in each government, in each political party, and, of course, in the United States. Must one point out that from ancient times the decline in courage has been considered the first symptom of the end? Then he cited the instances of modern Western cowardice, the fact that although we had the ability and the weapons and the men and the money to win World War II, we were so unsure of ourselves that we linked up with the USSR. That we shrank from victory in Southeast Asia, where 30 million suffer from our lack of will to defeat a tiny and backward nation. And how today, in fear of the Soviets, we are arming communist China in the hope that it will save us from communist Russia. Instead, he said, the Chinese will someday turn their own weapons, our own weapons against us and inflict upon us a massacre equal to that which occurred in Cambodia. If you recall, Pol Pot had everyone killed who had a ballpoint pen, who had glasses, who could read or write. Finally, he said, in the American democracy at the time of its birth, all individual rights were granted on the ground that man is God's creature. That is, freedom was given to the individual conditionally <coughs> on the assumption of his constant religious responsibility. Such was the history of the preceding 1,000 years. 200 or even 50 years ago, it would have seemed quite impossible in America that an individual be granted boundless freedom with no purpose, simply for the satisfaction of his own whims. Subsequently, however, all such limitations were eroded everywhere in the West. A total emancipation occurred from which the moral heritage of the Christian centuries with their great reserves of mercy and sacrifice. State systems were becoming ever more materialistic. The West has finally achieved the rights of man, but man's sense of responsibility to God and society has grown dimmer 
and dimmer. In the past decades, the legalistic selfishness of the Western approach to the world has reached its peak, and the world has found itself in a harsh spiritual crisis and a political impasse. All the celebrated technological achievements of progress, including the conquest of outer space, do not redeem the 20th century's moral poverty. I am sure that many of you recall the howls of rage that went up from that Harvard audience after that speech. Solzhenitsyn was denounced as an ingrate, a fanatic, a Christian bigot. George Steiner, the famous linguist and notorious anti-Christian, said in the New Yorker that the Russian was representative of a dark and blood-stained religion. The promoters of secular revolution in the United States set up such a clamor, and the Christian community remained so quiet that Solzhenitsyn became to this day a non-person here. One doesn't see his name in print. He's not quoted. He doesn't exist among our honored intellectuals. Our ministers and priests, poets and writers do not cite him or his observations. Universities do not report his story. Very few sermons are delivered from his example. And the gulag remains. Groups that did not protest and have now forgotten the slaughter of 300,000 priests and nuns in the Russian Revolution accused Solzhenitsyn of being intolerant. The forces of the secular revolution which I described to you this morning rage against him and against all other Christians. And his three books on the Gulag appeared. The information, the American intellectual said, like Tom Phillips said to me, was not new. No, a long string of, of refugees had reported these horrors. Other books had been written <coughs> and ignored. But the Gulag books were something else. A new phrase for an old nightmare entered the language of the world. Although the Soviets called Solzhenitsyn a traitor to his people and the American media turned its back, the mystique of the secular revolution in Russia was effectively shattered in very many places, but not here. In France, where Marxism had reigned undisputed among intellectuals ever since World War II, it suddenly became a synonym for stupidity. The intellectuals in France do not want to go to a concentration camp. And as the intellectuals shifted in France, the people of France began to regain some of their courage. When the socialists under Mitterrand announced that all Christian schools would be closed and all students would be sent to government schools, one million people appeared in Paris to march on the government buildings. One million. That was a Christian response. And Mitterrand changed his mind. <laughs> but the American intellectuals here in this nation have not changed their position. They continue to promote governmental moves against Christian churches and schools. They continue to argue that Christians should not voice their views in public and should remain in the largest religious ghetto in the world. Nor have American Christians made the fundamental changes that are necessary to support and strengthen the great revival now underway. It's encouraging, of course, to see that revival. But there is more to Christianity than conversion and prayer. Personal salvation is not possible to those who do not defend and support God in the world. Therefore, we must begin to form a Christian army of believers throughout this land to repudiate the forces of secular revolution. Every community, in my opinion, should not only have a Christian school, but should provide after-school instruction for the children of Christians too poor to afford an all-day Christian education. 
we should take a leaf from the long and significant experience of the Jewish diaspora and see to it that every child from every Christian home learns the history of Christianity, not in a purely denominational sense, but in an overall sense. Nor should such studies be limited to children. Every Christian adult is going to have to relearn what Christianity means and must mean if we and our faith are to survive this terrible crisis which is now entering a final and critical phase. For all Christianity is bound together by certain basics. What Solzhenitsyn said about Christian responsibility to the jeering students and faculty of Harvard was paralleled centuries ago by John Curran, who said, The condition which God hath given liberty to men is eternal vigilance, which condition, if broken, is loss of liberty. It's no accident that these two men, separated by four centuries of time, and thousands of miles of geography, and by different languages in different nations, should say the same thing, for both spoke from a Christian perspective. Nor is it an accident that modern governments, including our own, have now taken the position of Elizabeth I, that Christianity is to be put under the bureaucrats, who will tell us what we may believe and what we may express and where we may express it under pain of governmental punishment. Now the fact that here in the United States this has been put in the hands of the IRS is simply a measure of the American system in which the way to get an American's attention is through his money. The Soviets are only an extreme example of the control of religion and lands where the Marxist socialist rules, let us not forget that secular revolutionaries have triumphed almost entirely through the retreat, the silence, the fear, and the lack of faith among the descendants of Christians. Lack of a Christian response means a victory for anti-Christianity and all the terror and horror that it has meant for so many people. A Christian response, therefore, is not something that I can prescribe. It is something that must be revived from within the Christian community. It is something, however, I think that we here can instill what we can define, what we must defend, what we must expand, if we are to succeed in what I regard as a God-given task of Christian reconstruction. Thank you very much.